Okay. I just press the continue button. I hope that's okay. Yep, it's fine. Oh, okay. Thanks, Vinny. <laughs> I don't see anybody moving there except Sophia. Welcome, Wedsworth College and friends. I would like to start this evening with a statement of acknowledgement of traditional land. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. On behalf of the Woodsworth College Alumni Association, I am very pleased to welcome you this evening to our first Alumni Cafe event of the year. Uh, tonight, uh, Professor Becky Sigmund will be presenting a talk entitled From Fossils to Genes. Professor Sigmund is a paleoanthropologist with research interests in early human evolution. She has researched the origins of erect bipedalas and humanid fossils in the East and South Africa, as well as expeditions to Ethiopia. Professor Sigmund lived briefly with the sand hunter gatherers of the Kalahari Desert for the purpose of conceptualizing the nature of early human subsist subsist sub <laughs> subsistence patterns. Long-term interests are what is human, as reflected to of Sigmund's books, Human Ecology and Challenges in the 21st Century, and Physics, Evolution, God, Mass, and No Mass. Professor Sigmund, you're welcome to Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, I am... Um, I'm assuming that that everything is is okay and we've started. <laughs> All right, so I'll begin my talk. I wanted to um, begin by talking about my uh, working definition of uh, fossil and gene, which will fit into the talk I'm giving today. Uh, so to begin with, a fossil is an unbiased record of our past our evolutionary origins based on preserved remains usually found in the sediments of earth. A gene, on the other hand, 
is a record of one's own personal heritable biology uh, and the relationships that exist between that person or a group of people amongst individuals, amongst uh, families, and amongst populations. Secondly, there's some very interesting comparisons uh, and contrast between the study of uh, genes and the study of fossils. And I'd like to take uh, a brief look at what those are because they're quite relevant to understanding how the disciplines differ as well as how they are becoming a little bit more similar. The time that paleontologists deal with is or may be extremely long and today's talk will be dealing with the time of around four million years to one and a half million years and I'm defining that as the earliest hominid stage of evolution. The time that geneticists work with are primarily a lifespan and for individual uh, people that is about 100 years more or less, at least possibly 100 years. Although uh, the, life, the uh, time that, that geneticists are uh, able to deal with now uh, is beginning to be changed because of their introduction of a new specialization, ancient DNA, which we will discuss toward the end of the talk. Historically, uh, paleontology and genetics have proceeded in somewhat similar societal waves because it's society that has an influence on our belief systems. Uh, I will head back very quickly to 1850s, the middle of the 1800s. Uh, this was a time of Darwin when his big book came out on the origin of species. This was a time that the first Neanderthals were found. And this was a time that Mendel discovered uh, what we are now calling Mendelian genetics, the passing on of hereditary units in plants uh, to the next generation and what's the basis of it. So that was all happening in the 1850s. Very interesting correlations, both were being very active, but Neanderthals, which were the first fossils to be found, were rejected. People said they're not our ancestors, they're abnormal, they're pathological. Uh, we don't believe that we had an evolution like that. Uh, so there was also a lack of interest by science. With Mendel's work, there was simply a lack of interest. Uh, people were not really concerned. And so it sat uh, in his publications until a, about two generations later, when Mendel was rediscovered, and this was about the time that uh, paleontology of humans got started again. Uh, so that's a, a similarity and an overlap there. Genetics was rediscovered around the turn of the 20th century, uh, the early 1900s. Uh, and then it continued, especially by embryologists who took two different pathways of looking at the inheritance of traits and embryological development. And this is where the genes start doing their work. A visionary em uh, embryologist by the name of Waddington coined the term epigenetics, which now has become popular again, but for several generations it was rejected because it rang of Lamarckianism, that is the environment influences the genes, uh, and it, that was not what was considered by the other school of thought, where environment's just kind of noise. We are concerned with one gene, one trait. Well, consider we're the ones who make up what the traits are. How do the genes know that? Anyway, that's the way that genetics went for some period of time. Now we start to get together again um, in the 1950s. Mrs. Please, and that's in one of my descriptions of this talk. Mrs. Please was and is a fossil. I'm not sure if you can see, but I'm holding her here. Uh, and we will be looking at some slides of her later. This is a cast, obviously. The original is in South Africa. 
The importance of Mrs. Please is that it was the first time in uh, the history of paleontology uh, that um, it was recognized that we ourselves have an evolutionary past. And when I get to the slides, which will be shortly, uh, I will describe a little bit more, more why uh, she was so important and what traits that she held that had never been seen together before. What was happening in genetics at this time in the 1950s is another very big event, the uh, identification of uh, DNA, which is a term everybody knows now. It's become so popular in our gene-centric uh, biological world now. So this was a similarity. There were uh, two major events occurring both in genetics uh, and in paleontology. Paleontologists always included the environment uh, in their studies because it's the marker of evolution and uh, environmental studies were uh, always uh, a part of paleontology. But environment, as I pointed out before, was not a part and it wasn't again, interestingly, until the end of the 1900s that epigenetics now called the new epigenetics was discovered not by geneticists, but mostly by medical scientists in their work. Now, one last thing about the difference between fossils and genes is that there are rules in paleontology for how to go about naming new specimens. There's what we call the code of zoological nomenclature and that gives us rules by which we must or should follow. Sometimes people are not educated enough in that. And uh, so there we have a large number of names of fossils, uh, some which will eventually have to be erased and put into uh, other groups. There are no rules uh, of how geneticists should do their work. And this may be leading to a problem. Uh, those of you who have been reading about stem cells and some of the ethics and where the stem cells come from. Um, and uh, so that's the only rule that at the present time is present. So those are some of the interesting comparisons between genetics and uh, fossil studies. Uh, one last thing I'd like to say, I have divided the evolution of <clears throat> our uh, hominid family, and it's taxonomically a hominid family, based on one particular characteristic, which I'll uh, mention when we get to the first slide. And uh, I have divided our evolution into three stages. Uh, this would appall most paleontologists, but it's very appropriate for a uh, presentation of major traits in uh, a field. The earliest stage is the one I'm talking about today, uh, and it runs basically from a little over four million years in time to about one and a half million years in time. All the fossils within this time range and uh, given the particular traits we'll be talking about today uh, are called the Australopithecines. Australo means south and Pithecus means monkey-like or ape-like. So the very first uh, one that was found was thought to be a monkey-like southern ape. And that's the origin of the name and that's the origin of the first stage of human evolution. Just briefly, the second stage is basically Homo erectus, uh, and it goes from one and a half million to 200,000 years ago, and there are features uh, that characterize it, not for this particular lecture. And the third stage is ourselves, Homo sapiens, which uh, started at about 200,000 years ago, based on anatomically modern human skeletons. Okay, <clears throat> now, I can move on to the slides. Uh, I think I can move on to the slides. Hmm. Uh, okay, got some problem here. Um, option control, can somebody help me out here? I'm, I'm not, 
I'm not able to change the slide. Vinny, can you jump in here? Did I put uh, option uh, enter? Is that what I'm missing here? Benny, can you advise? Yeah, hi, sorry, I'm here. Um, yeah, can, I'm just wondering, uh, I'm not able to move yes. this on. So uh, can, can you, option. so option enter is not working okay. and the arrow keys are not working. Okay, yeah, thank there you. There we go. Okay, yeah, that's working. That, sorry. All right. <clears throat> so here is the actual discovery of Mrs. Please. And uh, again, I'm not sure uh, how much you can see here, but uh, compared to the shape of my head and the size of my head, a small woman, uh, this is uh, how big she is. It's, it's a replica. When it was first discovered, it was blasted uh, with dynamite out of limestone deposits. And the limestone deposits, fortunately enough, um, severed one piece that kept the entire skull intact, except that it divided it in half uh, right at uh, this particular point here. So what you can see, and if I can use my arrow, good. This would be the cranial cap, which is entombed in limestone, sort of uh, concretion. And the bottom of the skull is right here. So the two had just been separated. And this would have been taken uh, by the Johannesburg Star and published in their newspaper actually in 1947. Uh, because uh, before they did any further excavation, they uh, called to record this uh, fossil that is going to change scientific beliefs uh, to make science realize that we did indeed have an evolutionary past and we went into different stages of morphological development. The next slide. Uh, shows Dr. Broom, who is uh, pointing to the bottom of the skull. Um, and in the four slides, you see that uh, he is eventually, it's being taken out of the limestone, limestone con, um, concretions. And uh, this is partly by physical force and partly by uh, the use of uh, acetic acids of differing concentrations in order to expose it. So uh, this is a very significant discovery. Uh, it's what really changed the evolutionary thinking uh, in human paleontology. It's, uh, I just, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a magical uh, one to me. And I have had the fortune to see it uh, in real life in South Africa during my research periods. We can see a comparison here of a modern human on your right hand side with uh, Mrs. Please. Her actual uh, notation is STS5 for Sturkfontein number five. And uh, the Mrs. Please, the please stands for a name which is no longer in use. And that is Plesianthropus transvalensis, we don't want to call her that. Over the years, uh, it's found that uh, there is one uh, primary genus, and that's Australopithecus. And uh, she would have been the one that actually uh, proved that there is this genus. And so you can see that the cranial height of the two uh, indicates the size of the skulls. Um, and the size of the brain inside of them would have been very uh, different. In actual figures, uh, Mrs. Please has about 350 cubic centimeters of brain space, whereas modern humans on the average have 1,350. So uh, she's less than a third the size. And this uh, holds true for subsequent fossils that were found uh, of her own species. A lateral view shows a significant uh, discovery that not only was she small-brained, but that the brain 
came after the, that is the uh, expansion of the brain came after the origin of bipedalism. The uh, uh, support that you see at the back of her head uh, is um, indicating that the opening from the skull to the spinal cord uh, is, is vertically directed downward. And uh, again, if I can use the arrow, I'm talking about this arrow, uh, this location here. And that uh, is the same feature that we find in all human beings. We are upright bipeds. It was the first time that was discovered that erect bipedal posture came before the expansion of the brain. And this was, again, a monumental discovery. So this is the first um, of the major sites and uh, fossils that I'm going to be showing you. You'll note when we look later on at sedimentary deposits <clears throat> that they are very different than the limestone deposits, uh, which these fossils are found in. And it makes quite a difference also in the dating techniques. The next slide will take us to um, what I just mentioned to you, there is an opening in the base of the skull and the uh, vertebral column in human beings is basically vertical, whereas it's projecting back and it's concave or convex, depending on which way you look at it, uh, in the uh, apes that are the closest of our primate relatives. These areas, uh, the skull and the pelvis, uh, pelvic girdle, are extremely important uh, in indicating what kind of posture an animal has. How do uh, how do we how do we know uh, when we find a, a fossil that is going to belong in our human evolutionary lineage? Um, because we usually find fragments of it. Uh, again, this is a complete skeleton of the gorilla on your left and a human on the right-hand side. And if we find the area that was found in uh, Mrs. Please, uh, it's the big hole or the foramen ovale, uh, which uh, is a connection between the spinal column and the brain. And this comes out in an angle backwards in the gorilla and in almost all other animals, whereas it's vertical in human beings. The pelvis is extremely different in uh, human beings than any other animals and many of the other bones. Comparative anatomy is extremely important for uh, paleontologists to know because otherwise they are going to have problems in identifying animals. So comparative anatomy is what I'm emphasizing here. We spend years trying to learn the comparative anatomy of as many animals which are either closely related or not related, but might be in the uh, sediments with the other individuals. And if you just find a fraction uh, or a piece of a bone, it's sometimes very difficult to determine uh, whether it belongs to uh, a human being or a primate or uh, a carnivore. And so we spend years learning this and that's one of the ways that we can identify. We can also call in specialists who uh, know in this case, this would be horse. Uh, skeleton, and so they would be specialists in horses and could tell us whether it's a horse bone or a human. Uh, but that's uh, to come later. So to emphasize and to so sort of summarize the importance of South Africa and its contributions in Mrs. Please, we see this erect, uh, reconstruction of an erect biped uh, with an Australopithecus face and uh, there's a stone in his hand. Uh, tools were not being used this early, not four, not three, but uh, perhaps closer to two million years stones might have been used. The actual Mrs. Please is dated now at 2.5 million years by several different dates. And uh, I will be pointing out some of the dating techniques as we look at the different situations. I'll be moving now down to uh, the uh, location of a very famous site in Ethiopia. 
It's the site where Lucy, uh, a 40% complete uh, skeleton, which was fossilized uh, in just north of Addis Ababa. And it's uh, the Rift Valley, which we see in the next slide, uh, which is defined by these uh, triangles here. The Rift Valley uh, is a great er uh, area for erosion. The site is located in the Afar Depression. So during the times that the fossils uh, were uh, running around as living individuals, there would have been a great deal of geological and volcanic activity so that there was uh, volcanic ash that was deposited, uh, sediment, sediment, sedimentary sands and so on were deposited in order to um, create the site uh, where we're going to be going to just shortly. Paleontologists need the help of geologists, uh, and uh, it's the geologists that give us the information about the dating and following the strat uh, strat stratigraphic layers out uh, before we start picking fossils out of places when we are looking for them. They have to have a uh, location. Uh, before they can be dated. If they are on the ground and they haven't been uh, dated, then we have to use some other means. But when they're in the sediments, we can date the sediments by radioactive dating. Flying over these sedimentary remains in uh, Ethiopia, you see the serpentine uh, line going down the middle, which is actually an old stream bed. And uh, those are the places that one starts to look because of gravity when fossils are buried and then they begin to be uh, eroded out. Uh, obviously, gravity pulls them uh, downward. And uh, so paleontologists tend to walk in areas like this looking for fossils uh, at the bottom uh, and then tracing their origins upward uh, in these hills. Most of the ones you see range to be about uh, 300 feet in height. The next slide uh, shows them at a horizontal uh, level uh, and you get a very good idea of what it's like to be in the uh, sedimentary deposits in the Rift Valley. In the background, uh, the very last uh, hills that you see here, you can see a white line going across here and then another one above here, some down below. Those white lines represent volcanic tuffs, T-U-F-F. A volcanic tuff is the uh, ash that is left from the volcanic eruptions. And uh, fortunately, uh, everything uh, chemically begins again so we can radio uh, we can give uh, potassium argon dates of uh, these uh, volcanic deposits. I started to say carbon-14. Carbon-14 cannot be used uh, in paleontology because it takes more than 60,000 years to fossilize and carbon-14 can only date up to about 60,000 years. So the deposits I just uh, pointed out to you, the white lines in the background are going to be around the age of 3 million years. And the Lucy material would have been found just in, in or above or below some of these deposits at 2.8 million years. Paleontologists do a lot of walking uh, before they start to find uh, any fossils. And uh, they do have to be uh, well-versed in some comparative uh, skeletal biology. The site uh, here uh, that is being excavated and sieved uh, represents one find that was made the year after Lucy was discovered. It's called the first family. And it's called that because uh, the fossils that were eroding from this area, actually they were found first down in the uh, river valleys. Uh, and then uh, we walked up the hill until we found the basic sedimentary deposits they were coming from and started sipping to find uh, smaller pieces of bone. <clears throat> 
So uh, the uh, sediments here uh, are from the first family. What is the first family? Uh, it's a, a small population, possibly a family or a small group of early hominids that got caught uh, in either a flash flood or volcanic, uh, covered by volcanic ash by a volcanic eruption. Because somewhere around a dozen individuals or parts of individuals were found uh, somewhere in the order of, I think about three or four dozen specimens. Uh, and specimens can be just a fragment of a femur or a tooth uh, when they are found separately and not in the bone itself. Uh, but it was enough to say that there were uh, around 10 or 12 individuals, including some children, and they were all buried at the same time, 3.1 million years ago, and have been entombed uh, in the sediments until the expedition came and found them. And this makes one aware, uh, if it takes so long for a fossil to form, uh, we really should treasure them as something that uh, we cannot uh, we cannot make ourselves. Our lifespan is too short. We cannot make it. It's something that nature makes, and it's uh, it's something to marvel at and to be very grateful for. To understand uh, something about our past, which tells us something about ourselves. Now, if you were uh, in Hadar and you were one of the paleontologists walking around and looking for a fossil, I've uh, found this slide very instructive. Most of what you see are rocks and um, they are either brown or very gray, but somewhere in that slide, there is a fossil. And you can tell because uh, it just seems to have a slightly different uh, look and shape. But the next slide is a closer view of it and I apologize uh, for the darkness of it. Uh, what you see are molars that are erupting from a hippopotamus skull, which is turned upside down uh, because it's rolled out of the sedimentary layer that uh, it's found in, it's ro eroded out. So we just go back and uh, usually in an audience, I can see people, but I can't see you people and uh, I can get some reaction. I'm sorry, I have to pretend that I know you're there, but um, it's, it's just kind of, uh, uh, Zoom is still kind of uh, strange. Anyway, in the center of the picture, which I'm sure most of you have all picked out already is where this hippopotamus uh, skull was found. Okay. We go on to look at this strange looking uh, slide here. As I said previously, paleontologists are very interested in the environment. If you know something about an environment, you can tell how an animal is having to adapt to its environment. And the way it has uh, to adapt uh, has something to do with its morphology. It, uh, it, it has to find food in the environment that is living in. So environment and uh, form and function uh, go very much close together, which is something that it took geneticists to learn a little bit longer, uh, but then they're very, very different disciplines. And the fact that they are uh, learning now is, uh, is quite amazing. Anyway, to get back to this slide, these are well-preserved crocodile eggs. Uh, and that's highly unusual. So that suggests that uh, the water in this area was moving very slowly. Either it was uh, a very still lake or a very uh, slow moving uh, stream bed um, for crocodiles to lay their eggs and for them to be covered uh, with sediment and to fossilize over uh, three million years. This particular site is famous for that because uh, it's so rich in a variety of other fauna than just uh, hominids. Well, you guessed it, this is Lucy. And uh, we have enough of the skull, of the mandible and some parts of the cranium uh, to see something about her diet because teeth reflect the diet uh, of uh, an animal. And we have the pelvis and the femur, which uh, is 
definitely that of an erect biped. So once again, around 3 million years ago, or more precisely 2.8 million years as dated by potassium argon, uh, this uh, person lived, it's thought to be a female because male and female pelvises look different today and they probably looked a little different uh, 3 million years ago. Although that's a problem one has to consider as well. Are we comparing different uh, skeletons with different uh, morphologies if we use Homo sapiens? Uh, but that's a problem we were also starting to sort out. So this is Lucy, uh, and she's famous because we can now correlate uh, cranial uh, features with uh, upright bipedalism. Uh, with Mrs. Please, there was no postcranial material, so we had no pelvis, no femur. Uh, we only assumed that she was an upright biped based on the cranial features and the location of the uh, connection to the brain and the spinal cord. After a day in the field, we're still at Hadar, and uh, we've come back in the evening and, uh, or in the afternoon and uh, put our finds out on a table and then try to uh, figure out what they are. Uh, they all have been classified before removing from the sediment. Uh, we carry little notebooks around. And uh, so you have to know what geological uh, sedimentary layer they're coming from. Uh, and so these represent uh, uh, a variety of the animals that uh, were present. There's only one fossil in there that is a hominid fossil. That's not the one in the center. The one in the center is a monkey. Uh, it's too prognathic and the skull is too small, but just right of it, that one with the big head of a femur uh, is enough to tell us that it comes from an upright biped. Uh, so once again, know your comparative anatomy. Okay, that's uh, my second um, major site that I think has uh, been extremely important in guiding uh, other people to uh, compare their more recent finds with the first ones that were found that showed a combination of traits or uh, a change in the belief systems. The entire leaky family uh, has been extremely prominent uh, in human paleontology, and I have uh, focused on Richard Leakey and uh, when he was younger and very active in the field. And uh, one of his uh, good friends, uh, a Kikuyu, at least you see that from the neck down, uh, and what an Australopithecus might have looked like. I think it's a bit out of balance, uh, but uh, it still shows that uh, they, uh, if a Kikuyu had the body of a, a Nostalopithecus, it would be much better. But anyway, uh, it's to show that Richard Leakey uh, has been very prominent in the field and has encouraged interdisciplinary uh, research. He has brought in uh, not only paleontologists, but people who are specialists in uh, different faunal uh, remains, people who are specialists in environment, geologists he's brought in uh, to his researches, and uh, a new field that uh, started developing around this time, taphonomy, the study of how uh, the dead uh, are distributed, are they found in place, or have they been moved by stream beds and so on, because it makes a difference when you're reconstructing what the environment is. So I just want to give credit uh, to this person who's done a great deal of work in Kenya. And one of the deposits of uh, his that was found uh, is referred to as the KBS Tuff, named after a taphonomist, uh, K. Berensmeyer. This particular tuff uh, gave uh, problems to paleontologists because uh, it did uh, give two different dates uh, dated from different laboratories. Now, science has to be reproducible to be believed. And uh, these dates should have been the same because they were taken from the same sample that these geologists are uh, taking up right now. 
The problem was there was contamination in one of the samples. Well, which one was it? One laboratory was dating the samples at uh, 1.8 million years, and the other one was dating it at 2.6. <clears throat> that doesn't work in science. So uh, more samples were taken, and uh, other laboratories were included. And uh, the actual date turned out to be uh, the older date, 2.8. And uh, so this is how science works. And that's just another example uh, that I thought was important to throw in. We are careful and there are a number of ways to date uh, our, our material, not just uh, one. And if it isn't right, then we know it's not right and uh, we try to make it right. A view of Old Vi Gorge, because now we're going to be heading down into Tanzania. This is what the environment looks like. And in front of you uh, is um, two million years of deposits. Right in the center, you see the uh, river valley and then projecting up from it. This is an extraordinary uh, paleontological uh, location. And it has served as this sort of model and the base for comparisons of material from uh, other locations. I didn't want to emphasize this because it's uh, so prominent in so many things, but it, uh, it has been uh, extremely useful in paleontology and uh, give credit to uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey who discovered it and did a lot of work there. Now we're going to be moving further south from Olduvai Gorge, uh, about 40 miles south of there. The Maasai uh, still live in the Olduvai Gorge region, and the Maasai move around uh, a group of local indigenous people. They move around uh, quite readily by walking 40 miles, no problem in a day. So one month I said to Mary Leakey, we think we found something you might be interested in just uh, down here about 40 miles <laughs> that we walked yesterday. Uh, maybe you would like to know and uh, would like to come look at it. And so Mary Leakey did uh, make the trip to a place called Laitoli in Tanzania. And uh, she's there <clears throat> uh, being photographed uh, when it was found. And uh, what was found were hominid footprints. Uh, more hominid footprints and older than any that were known at the time. And these footprints have become so famous. Well, this is how the talk was advertised. So you've seen uh, a picture of them, uh, but they're absolutely phenomenal. Uh, how did they happen? Well, um, they cover a large area and there were more than hominid footprints there. There were footprints of a number of different fauna. Uh, and they seem to be uh, like so. These were the hominid footprints, two sets of them. Uh, and this is an artist's reconstruction of uh, the hominids that are rushing away from the um, Sadaman volcano, which is erupting. And this gives you an idea of the situation that is uh, 3.7 million years in age. So 3.7 million years ago, there was an eruption from a local um, volcano. These animals got caught in it, giraffes, uh, various bird species, elephants, all of these uh, footprints uh, are found in this particular area. It's a fantastic location. And there's absolutely nothing else like it in uh, human paleontology. The artist's reconstruction is, uh, is simply that uh, these footprints were uh, made by two uh, early hominids. And again, you get a view of what people, uh, artists uh, have, uh, or think that the Australopithecines look like. And I think the next slide, whoops, I missed that. Uh, this is uh, the slide which shows that they were walking together in family style and uh, these were preserved and dated at 3.75 million years. So it, they're not necessarily the oldest ones now, 
but to find them in a in a situation like this uh, is absolutely uh, a marvelous uh, discovery. Well, in summary of the three sites that uh, I was talking with you about, um, there are the limestone caverns in South Africa and the change in belief systems caused by Mrs. Please. And then there is the uh, fact that nobody knew until Mrs. Please that erect bipedalism preceded the beginning beginning of expansion of the brain, which continued into the later Australopithecus stage and into the Homo erectus stage, and then finally into the Homo sapiens stage. And it was the most uh, noticeable uh, continuous trend of increase in brain capacity uh, that is present in, in this uh, uh, lineage. So, um, that uh, that was Hadar, and then we went to uh, east uh, uh, to uh, Kenya, and uh, and then this. So these are some of the major sites that have made uh, marvelous uh, contributions to the field of paleontology uh, and to human evolution. And in each one of them, we've wanted to know what the environment was. How did the environment influence the uh, the development of this particular lineage. And another very interesting phenomenon, which I'll talk about here, is the fact that every, uh, ever since uh, Mrs. Please was found, it has been sort of like a fossil gold rush. Uh, paleontologists have wanted to go and find their own uh, hominids. And so there has been a plethora of names this probably represents that there was a great deal of biological variation in our lineage. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize is the fact that there still is a lot of biological variation in our lineage. Uh, they used to be called races. Uh, now we don't use that term, uh, but the fact is there's a great deal of biological variation. And that's directly related to the environment that they are living in and trying to survive in. So the biological variation that's present in the early hominids uh, can be representative of the lineage itself. And the next slide shows <clears throat> just a quick view of what these are going to become. It's either late, uh, Australopithecus or early Homo erectus. And these being Homo erectus uh, are thought by paleontologists to represent our ancestors, the ancestors of all later Homo sapiens. The brain size is larger than those in uh, uh, the Australopithecus stage. And there are some other features as well. They're much more robust. They were beginning to move into colder climates. Uh, and so forth. So that's just a very quick uh, view of an artist's reconstruction of what the Australopithecus stage is going to be leading to. And then finally, I'm going to be talking just a little bit about Neanderthal. These are reconstructions of late Homo erectus or early uh, Homo sapiens based on some Neanderthal uh, remains. And I give you nine different uh, interpretations by nine different artists. So this represents uh, not only you've got a skull, but uh, how you interpret what it looks like can vary tremendously. But the fact is there was really a great deal of variation, biological variation uh, in our species. I think now we're going to be moving to uh, ancient DNA, and uh, I'll finish uh, the talk off with uh, a discussion of ancient DNA, what it is, uh, what it may tell us, and what are some of the problems. Why do I use this? Uh, it's just to remind us that what DNA does tell us is uh, relationships, biological relationships amongst families. Uh, I think most Canadians will probably recognize uh, 
who this family is uh, because of the English origins, Queen Victoria's family. And uh, she's sitting there right in the middle uh, at the bottom, Queen Victoria. And up to her left is um, a Russian, uh, Alexandra, who is uh, going to be married to Nicholas. These were actually people were done away with. But the important thing I want to show is there is a relationship, uh, a genetic relationship from the idea that there is one gene to one trait. And the trait that these women carried uh, was hemophilia. Now, hemophilia, uh, and we look at the family tree that's being drawn, uh, has been, been made famous by this uh, little boy here, Alexis, uh, and um, the monk that uh, treated him. He had hemophilia. Where did he get hemophilia? It has uh, been drawn in this chart that it came from his great grandmother and possibly even one gen generation earlier <clears throat> because it's carried on the X chromosome. And I won't go into the detail of that, but uh, it's what can be done with genetic studies. One can trace genetic relationships among families, individuals and populations. Uh, so, um, that's just to remind you of the differences of genetics and, uh, uh, and, uh, and fossils and fossil studies. So what uh, ancient DNA is and what you're looking at here actually, and this will be my last slide. I made it blurred because it's uh, an old picture of Neanderthal uh, not the first one that was found, but uh, some later ones that were found. And uh, the old fashioned idea is that, well, these don't look like us, but, uh, and besides they look kind of uh, slow and dense and so on. So poor old uh, Neanderthal got a, a bad start. First of all, it was ignored and then uh, considered abnormal and then considered uh, really uh, a backward sort of thing, which was a side branch maybe of uh, human evolution. Well, what does uh, ancient DNA have to do with this? Because somebody tried to find DNA in Neanderthal. Well, uh, let's just backtrack a little bit. What is ancient DNA? Uh, ancient DNA uh, are bits and pieces of DNA in old bones and teeth uh, that are found after death. Neanderthal was not the first that was studied for his DNA. The first was a 150 year old uh, indigenous uh, American uh, person. And uh, it was done by a curious geneticist who said, I wonder if we can find any DNA in dead people or how long it takes for the DNA to uh, deteriorate or degrade or simply uh, just uh, fade away from, uh, from existence. And uh, so he did and he found uh, some bits and pieces of DNA in this 150 year old uh, indigenous American uh, person. Uh, then around the turn of the century, uh, more curious researchers in genetics decided that they would start uh, seeing if they could find DNA in other um, animals and in other individuals. And so uh, the bits and pieces, why is it only bits and pieces and why is there any at all? Well, first of all, um, there's not going to be any in Australopithecus because Australopithecus is a true fossil. Uh, it is totally inorganic. Uh, and a true fossil is one in which the organic uh, has, has changed through time into being inorganic material. So if there's no organic material there, then, uh, then there cannot be any DNA. However, uh, geneticists are still wanting to study fossils and uh, maybe the younger ones. Well, um, 
So this is what a DNA or uh, ancient DNA is. Uh, some of the problems with ancient DNA, in spite of the fact that uh, it has been found in a variety of animals, just bits and pieces. It's very expensive to run the test and there are problems all the way along the, the line. First of all, it's destructive to the fossils or the subfossils and the bones. And uh, because bits of bone has to be drilled out of the teeth and the uh, bone of the uh, fossil or the subfossil. Uh, another problem and a really big problem is contamination. The samples that are in the uh, soil uh, are already uh, possibly contaminated by fungi or bacteria. And uh, at any step along the way, there may be contamination as the sample is being moved from uh, the uh, earth where it was buried into the laboratory, into the chemical tests that have to be done on it and so on. And one very interesting example of this is uh, some uh, person thought uh, he had some dinosaur, now that's very old, a dinosaur uh, DNA. And uh, when he tested and looked at it, uh, he was very curious to see what it was and what he saw is Y chromosome. In other words, uh, the laboratory worker himself was testing his own DNA. So the contamination is extremely uh, touch and go uh, with these bits and pieces. There has been uh, a sample of a Neanderthal in which apparently the entire genome was done, uh, one at about the age of 38,000 years. And um, I have not read too much about that. And uh, it's, 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 it's a very rare find. And uh, to date, something oh, that old uh, is, is extremely touchy. But it has been published. Uh, and uh, so the comparisons now have been made between Neanderthal DNA and uh, human DNA. And you can look on the internet and uh, read about this and how you can determine how much DNA you have, which is related to uh, Neanderthals. I think ancient DNA studies have perhaps a long way to go because of some of these problems uh, of which I mentioned. One new problem that uh, has occurred very recently and which I read about is that uh, with the, uh, the longer something uh, is lying dead and in the earth, uh, the more uh, degraded becomes the DNA. Most of the time, it's almost impossible to find. Uh, so the sampling uh, just goes uh, without any results. But it has been suggested that the DNA that is in um, the bodies of these older specimens, the DNA itself, if there is any left, may be mutating. So, uh, uh, if that's the case, then comparisons between uh, Neanderthals or any older specimens with modern specimens or modern species uh, is perhaps touch and go. Well, um, I've tried to highlight uh, for you uh, in a very quick fashion uh, this, uh, something about how fossils and genes uh, do have something in common. And uh, with the development of new methods, perhaps for a DNA or finding more <clears throat> subfossils, uh, we, we may be able to make relationships as the DNA researchers are uh, between populations and possibly even diseases. But one of the problems with diseases is there's a variety of, uh, a great variety in diseases, even hemophilia. There are several types of uh, hemophilia. And um, so this may prove to be some problem as well. I'll conclude with um, saying and emphasizing that there always has been a large amount of biological and morphological variation uh, in uh, human beings and in our evolutionary lineage. And then it's a very good feature to have because it's the source of the continuation and the continuing evolution of uh, our uh, species. And my last conclusion is that 
one of the best things I think that we can do is to uh, work together and learn a little bit more of each other's disciplines, geneticists learning a little bit more about anthropology and vice versa. Uh, and uh, with improving technology, perhaps ancient DNA studies will also uh, become a little bit more developed. Um, and they're just kind of struggling now, uh, but that's the way with uh, any good science. So, um, if we can work together, uh, we could contribute a great deal of information to uh, what our species is all about. And this may be two powerful to tours, tools, sorry. These may be two powerful tools uh, for the further evolution of our species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sigmund. I will jump right into the Q&A session. And just a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, just put them down below in the Q&A icon, uh, bottom right of your toolbar. So the first question is, I believe it's about uh, Mrs. Please. The question asks, have they found or theorized the reason it was only the skull and not the entire skeleton that was found? Uh, yes, there is a possible uh, answer to that. <clears throat> Teeth uh, are, um, there are certain bones that are thicker, uh, more mass, and so they tend to foss, they, they tend to preserve better. Uh, some bones like the ribs are uh, very fragile and so on. And uh, so that's, that's one difference in the morphology of the skeleton. Uh, you tend to find more teeth and you tend to find more of the hard bones. And that's why the head of the femur, for example. Uh, why would you find the cranium? Well, uh, the cranium is not uh, that thick a bone. That's just uh, happens to be good luck uh, in this particular case. And uh, um, so aside from that, it's, it's, sorry, there's one other feature. And that is, uh, there has been more cranial material found before uh, we started finding postcranial material because that's what people are looking for. And when they start finding uh, what they're looking for, uh, you know, they will identify that first. There may be a femur lying beside the skull, but they're going to go directly to the skull instead. And um, so part of it is a, a behavioral response from humans liking the skull. We talk about uh, that more than we do talk about the foot or, or the pelvis. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Richard Leakey uh, decided that they needed to know more about the, the uh, postcranial uh, material uh, and uh, to find out what the morphology was, and they uh, showed the people who are working, this is what a bone looks like uh, of, the, of the lower limb. This is what a pelvis looks like. And uh, so they started studying that. And instead of looking for heads, they started finding uh, pelvises and femora and so on. It's, uh, so it's a noticeable, what are you looking for? And uh, that's what you're going to see. <laughs> Thank you. Next question is, is it possible that more of Lucy's skeleton is out there somewhere, or is it more likely that for one reason or another, they were not preserved following Lucy's death? Um, I don't think there would be any more of Lucy's skeleton because uh, there was uh, a lot of excavating that was done to see if they could find more of her. So it was just some parts that were eroding out uh, and these were the ones that were found. The material was sieved like you saw in the slide. Uh, and if there had been any more material, I think they would have found it. So we didn't find any more of her. But of the first family, um, again, there was a great deal of, uh, of uh, work that was going on to see if any more could be found in and around that area. Uh, and uh, that it could not be. And if you find something that's further away, you can't identify it as being you know, a part of that particular family. You could identify the time, but not of that family or that group uh, of people. Thank you. Next question. 
Do we have evidence of extinct diseases or of earlier iteration of diseases found in the specimens of early hominids? Not of early hominids. We, we, we do not. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> That's a simple answer. In the latest one, in, in later um, remains, we can, and this is true in possibly in some of the Neanderthal. Uh, there may be some diseases that they had that we have, um, but not in, uh, there, there's nothing comparable that, that has been found in the earliest stage of uh, Australopithecus evolution. Next question is, I was wondering what your quick opinion is on degeneration theory rising in the 19th century and if there are physical or physiological evidence. The degeneration theory, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, uh, so whoever submitted that question, maybe they can, yeah, I can uh, elaborate a little bit. What you mean? Okay. Um, there's a question, it sounds like perhaps some a career advice. <laughs> uh, someone was asking, in your experience, what do you think is the best way for an individual to get involved in the ancient DNA field? Ah. <laughs> uh, I, I think you would have to uh, go to graduate school in genetics uh, and uh, you would have to learn your basic genetics and then opt for studying with somebody. And there aren't that many people yet who are uh, doing ancient DNA, but there it would take a lot of background uh, in genetics itself to do that. And uh, some good luck to get in with uh, the right crowd. Another question is, uh, have there been any similar finds as those in Africa in other countries? specifically matching the periods you spoke about? Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's a good question. There have been some questionable uh, funds which had been made in uh, East Africa of one of the Australopithecine groups, uh, but it has, uh, it's very controversial. So primarily this, I mean, the very earliest stages, uh, they would only, they are only being found in, uh, in South Africa and East Africa at the present time. When we're getting up to uh, the later stages of time, however, one and a half million years, uh, we're already beginning to get into some of the, the uh, trans transitional forms. Uh, and so by that time, they are beginning to be in the old world, in Asia uh, especially. Uh, again, it's uh, not my area to know specifically, but uh, there are uh, some that are found in the old world as well. They got out of Africa. <laughs> we have another question about disease. So the question asks, do forms of diseases correlate with environment or with biological evolution? In other words, does disease correlate more with genetic makeup of specific groups of races living in specific environments? We probably have that answer uh, in the last past uh, year and a half. <laughs> um, there are some people who seem to be uh, more immune to uh, our pandemic uh, problem and some who are less uh, it, because of the variation in individuals. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that answers the question or not, just by a, a comparison with, with the results of what's happened with COVID. Does it? They will have to let us know. <laughs> Another question is, um, it sounds like uh, you are very doubtful of ancient DNA. Uh, have the methods not improved? Um, yeah, I didn't, uh, I was trying not to be opinionate, opinionated. Uh, it's, uh, it's just I've been reading so much about the problems, even by the geneticists themselves. And some of the scientists who are saying things like, uh, they're feeling threatened about their fossils. They're saying that there should be rules and regulations 
to protect our fossils from uh, the research by the people in doing ancient DNA. Otherwise, they'll begin to look like Swiss cheese. And that's because you have to drill out samples of them from the teeth and from the and from the fossilized bone. So if you're going to be doing that, it's, it's a destructive technique. And the second uh, aspect of that, which was pointed out in an article I read recently, is that uh, the study is non-reproducible. Uh, you can't do it twice on the same Neanderthal. Uh, and, you, um, uh, and you can't reproduce the results, which is one of the mandates of uh, scientific, scientific research. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. We had a follow-up message from the individual who asked about um, Jesus. And uh, he says, I think this answer will have implications for DNA research, whether it is worth it on specific cases or not, I think. But thank you so much for the first answer. <laughs> so some follow-up thoughts. So I think we will conclude uh, the Q&A session now. Thank you very much, everyone, for submitting your questions. I'm sure uh, Professor Sigmund's email inbox is open to um, future correspondence. So, Erin? Okay. I will. Oops. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you, uh, Sophia. Um, so Dr. Sigmund, on behalf of the Wordsworth College Alumni Association and on behalf of those from the alumni community who were able to join us tonight, I would like to thank you for taking the time to speak with us this evening. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone when I say that I will be leaving this Zoom lecture knowing more about fossils and genes. And I'll definitely be having more questions and an interest in this topic. I'm sure I'll be Googling things later. Sure. Um, as you know, um, as many of you know, the Alumni Cafe series is the Wordsworth College Alumni Association's flagship lecture series, and we have been holding these for years. I'm very happy that we have been able to continue holding these lectures during the pandemic, and the Alumni Association is very thankful to experts like yourself, Dr. Sigmund, for participating and allowing us to continue these learning events. So one last time, I thank you, Dr. Sigmund, for sharing not only your expertise, but also your time and patience to educate the alumni community and answer our questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Absolutely. Okay. I guess we all leave now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. <laughs> thank you, Professor Sigmund. Okay, you're very welcome. And thank thanks you. to everyone for okay. joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Sophia. Thank you. Great. Okay.